I'm, I'm really sorry I couldn't be physically with you guys in, in Chicago, but I still just say that uh, there are some kind of bureaucratic problems even in the US. But anyway, uh, so I'm going to talk about family and inequality. Um, we, inequality, I mean, you, you've been uh, listening a lot of stuff about inequality, so I guess now you, you are familiar with the notion of inequality, the way we measure it, and so on and so forth. There is an old problem, if you look at this literature as it was 50 years ago, which is um, what do you do with families of different size? Assume that in an economy you got a couple and then you got singles and the couple has an income 10 and each single has an income 5. Uh, it, would you say that this is a... Uh, did, would you say there is inequality here because one family has 10 and the other one has 5? Or would you say that on average, each person has five, so it's perfectly equalitarian. And uh, so that's an old technical problem. It used to be a technical problem. What I will try to convince you of is that in the end, there is no way you can address the technical problem without looking at much deeper and much more conceptual issues. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about. And one problem, one problem that I will call newer is what can we say about intra-household inequality? In other words, if I have this couple with, a, with an income of 10, do I have to assume that each person in the, in the couple has an income of 5? Or is it, can I say something more than this? Uh, in, in a sense, it's not a new problem. It's an old problem. But uh, the fact that we can answer it is that that's that, that the new stuff. And I will try to convince you now that now we have the empirical, both the conceptual and the empirical tools that allow us to, to answer this kind of question. Let me start with something very basic. In the end, what we're interested in is not inequality across families, it's inequality across people. In other words, think as a thought experiment, think of a society in which you have many families. All families have exactly the same income, but there is a huge level of inequality within the family. Say, the husband has everything and the wife has nothing. You would not call this society an equal society. Just because there is a huge amount of inequality, but of course the inequality is within the family, it's not outside. But it's something that we cannot neglect. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start with a simple example, and then we're going to, we're going to move to the, to the real thing. So here is the simple example. The, my, in, in this economy, I have two couples. One has an income 10, and the other has an income 11. So if in terms of intra-family inequality, the inequality is very low. You can, you can measure it in various ways. The simplest way at that point is to use a, a tie index, which is an entropy index. Uh, so the tie index, I don't know how familiar you are, but the tie index would be you, uh, you compute the, the ratio of, in, of the income of any family uh, divided by the average income. Uh, the average family income in this economy, you multiply this by the log of the same stuff, you add up over everyone, and you divide by the number of, of families. So if you do the computations here, you, you find something very small, something like uh, 1,000, uh, which simply reflects that this is not a very unequal family. Now, you could tell a slightly different story. You could say, well, I don't have two families, I have four people. And let's just for the moment assume that each one in each family receives exactly half the income of the family. So I have two people in the first family. Each of them is receiving an income of 5. The average per capita income is 5.25. In the second family, I have two people. Each of them has an income of 5.5. And I can do the computation, and I find exactly the same number. Now, you can easily check that that's not by chance. Those computations give you exactly the same number, and it's nice property, inverse property of the Italian index. OK, so far, so good. Let's, let's introduce some movement here. Let's assume that one of the couple is divorcing. So now, that was the, the couple with the total income equal to 10. Now they divorce, and he gets 7, and she gets 3. What, what happens to the inequality? Well, there are two ways of computing the inequality. The first way is to say, well, now we have three families. One is a couple, the other, the other two are single, but we have three families, so the average, the total income in this economy is 21, so the average is 7. I have this couple with, a, with an income 11 over 7, and then I have this, the first single, the male, with an income of 7, and the female with an income of 3. That gives you the total inequality. Now, not surprisingly, you find the number which is much, much larger about 40 times larger than the previous one. 
you have created a lot of inequality by this divorce. Uh, well, you could say, but that, that's a bit strange because I am I'm giving exactly the same weight to a two-person family and to uh, the one-person family. So the alternative could be, let's assume that, there, let's, let's do exactly the same trick as before. Let's, let's pretend that there are two people in the, in the family with an 11 income. There are two people, each of them has an income 5.5. And you do exactly the same computation. Now you find something slightly different, essentially, because there is a difference between assuming three families and four families. Uh, but you get a number which is still much, much higher than before. So in both cases, you see a huge increase in inequality, actually by a factor which is uh, close to 40. And by the way, this, this is an example, but uh, you see a lot of this in the US. There has been a, a considerable increase in inequality since the 1980s. And a, a fraction of this, actually a large fraction of this, is due to the fact that the number of, of single person family has increased a lot. Now, from a conceptual point of view, there is a problem here, which is, I mean, those, the two people, the seven and the three people, the, the male with an income seven and the female with an income three, this is uncontroversial. We observe their income. The problem is with the, the, the family with an income of 11, uh, here I'm pretending that each person in this family is receiving exactly 50%. So I will assume that the income of each person is 5.5. I will take two numbers. Uh, they must add up to 11, and they must be equal. Those are two assumptions. And from a conceptual point of view, both assumptions are debatable. <coughs> so the two assumptions are, first of all, that I will allocate an income to each person, a virtual income. And those two incomes must add up to the total income of the family. And the second assumption is that I will take those two incomes to be equal. There are two assumptions, and even the first one is debatable. Why is the first one debatable? Because essentially what I'm assuming is the, the income you get uh, as, as if a couple with an income 10 is exactly as well off as two individuals with income 5 each. So what am I disregarding here? I'm, regard, I'm disregarding public good, economies of scale, and things like this. In practice, it might be that the, the, the kind of standard of living that you can achieve being a couple with, with an income of 10 is much more than the, couple of, uh, the standard of living that each person can achieve with an income of 5. Public good will give you this. Uh, economies of scale will give you this, and so on and so forth. Remember, that's something we cannot disregard, because those public goods or those economies of scale might be part of the reason why the family was created to start with. I mean, there is an old question, which is why do people form families? Of course, there are plenty of non-economic reasons for doing this. But we know that there are economic reasons. We know that there are economies of scale. We know that there are public good. Actually, at the end of my talk, I will give you some kind of estimates of this. Uh, so assuming away those aspects is something we don't want to do. And even more serious is the second issue, which is we're assuming equal sharing, and we don't have any serious reason of doing this. Actually, if you think of it retrospectively, when I see that this couple of 10 has divorced, and he receives seven, and she received three, that very strongly indicates that when they were married, the, the allocation was not 5-5. Five, five. It's very hard to find a story, you know, a convincing story based on bargaining, in which he can get seven by divorcing, she can get only three. Uh, but within the, within the household, the bargaining process gives five to each other. That would violate individual rationality. What's very likely to happen is that even when they were married, the distribution within the family was unequal. And of course, this changes everything. Let me go back to the initial economy before the divorce. So I had those two couples. But let's assume that I was assuming when I made my computation that each person was receiving 50% of the household income. Let's assume that the true distribution, assuming that I can observe it, was in fact he gets seven, she gets three in the $10 income couple, and he gets 7.5, she gets 3.5 in the $11 uh, income couple. Then the true inequality was, in fact, something like 7 to the 10 minus 2. So that's about 70 times as large as the, the number I had before. So just to conclude from this example, what do we learn from this example? The first thing is, when we started with those two couples with income 10 and 11, 
It was apparently easy to make inequality computation, but in fact, those inequality computations were probably completely wrong because we were disregarding intrafamily allocation and intrafamily inequality, and this can be crucial. In other words, it's, it's, all, it's in general the case that if you assume equal sharing, you have lower level of inequality, but the true inequality must, uh, can be higher, and in some cases, it can be much higher. Now, my example is sort of extreme, and the inequality was basically zero uh, without uh, the intra-household inequality, and was much, much larger with the intra-household inequality. At the end of my talk, I will give you some kind of real-life estimation, but it's, it's reasonable to think that as much as 30% of, of total inequality might be due to intrafamily inequality in the UK. And my personal uh, feeling is that it, it, it may be much more than this in, in developing countries. Why does it matter? Look at a claim like this. That's something I, I alluded to. Uh, the claim here is we know that there has been an increase in poverty over the recent years. And this increase is mostly due to the fact that there are much more single person or single parents household now than the, it used to be the case uh, 30 years ago. That's a statement that you should take with extreme caution. Why that? Well, uh, as you know, there are many prominent economists working on inequality. I didn't want to antagonize anyone by, by citing uh, an identified person. So the, the, the citation that you see on the screen, I, I took it from Wikipedia. So at least it's anonymous. <laughs> now look carefully at this, at this uh, statement. Uh, the statement says in 2007, 5.8% of all people in married families lived in poverty, as opposed to 19.1% uh, of persons living alone. My claim is this statement is incorrect. You don't need to change much to transform it into a correct statement, but as such, the statement is incorrect. Now, first of all, you're familiar with the notion of poverty. Essentially, there is a, a definition of poverty. There is an income below which you're supposed to be in poverty. And the last statement, the 19.1%, is telling you, if you look at single person households, 19% of them or 20% of them are below the poverty line. And that's uncontroversial. I mean, we, we might discuss the definition of the poverty line, but, but the number of people below is just a matter of public accounting. Now, look at the first statement. The 5.8 of all people in married family live in poverty. The correct statement would have been 5.8% of all people lived in couples or in, in, uh, in married families in which the total income of the family is below the poverty line defined for that household size. But you cannot make a statement about the people, because how many people are below or above the poverty line assumes something about the distribution within a household. And I'm co I know for a fact that in this statement, no such computation is made. Now, what I'm going to spend some time trying to convince you of is that you can make this kind of computation. It's, you, you need assumption, you need some technology, but it's feasible. But the point is, if you don't make those computations, you end up with statements like this, and those statements might be completely wrong just because we don't know how many of these married people are below the poverty line. It might be that in families in which the, 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 the family income is above the poverty line, some people are still below it just because they receive a very small share of total income. And actually, this is, must be true for the for developed countries, for the US or the UK. Obviously, it must be even stronger for developing countries. Assume that you're talking about East Africa. And if you're, if you're saying that, if, you, if you're making an assumption that if, if uh, rural households in Malawi, uh, the distribution of income is, uh, is equal be between men and women, this is a laughable assumption. We, we all know that it's not the case. And we don't want to make this kind of assumption. OK, so that's the, the initial examples. Is there any question to that point? OK, let's continue. Now, there are two types of problems. The, first of all, there are some conceptual problems. Uh, they are, as I said, they are all problems, but, but they are, they are, the fact that you apply them at the family level give them some kind of uh, of a new relevance. One is how do we deal with intra-household allocation? That's the obvious one. Uh, a bit more complex, but, but, but still quite important. 
How do we deal with public good? How do we deal with economies of scale? How do we deal with the fact that being in a couple with an income of 10 is not the same as being two singles, each of them with an income of five? Let's try to be a little bit deeper. And this is the kind of question that if you want to be serious about the, the, the first two, you cannot avoid. What are the relationships between preferences when single and preferences with, uh, within a couple? Well, think of housing, for instance. There is some uh, benefit you derive from housing when you're single. There is some benefit you der derive from housing when you're, when you're in, a, in a couple. Uh, should I assume that the same level of housing provides the same level of utility of welfare of to people independently on whether they're in couple of or single? That may sound like, like, a, like a difficult question, but I will try to convince you that it's crucial. And let me come to an even deeper question. Which inequality should we look at? Should we look at inequality of income, or should we look at inequality in welfare? Well, if you think of it, essentially, the, 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 the literature on inequality deals with income, which is a bit strange, because we, as economists, we, we, we think essentially in terms of welfare. And we, we do computation about income, about consumption, about labor supply. But in the end, what we're ultimately interested in is, is something like welfare allocation. Uh, so should we? consider inequality in welfare instead of inequality in income. And this is a debate that took place like, like 40 or 50 years ago. Uh, they are very strong. In principle, this idea of inequality in welfare is appealing. But there are very serious downsides, which, which explain why it has, it, it has not gone very far. The first one is from the technical point of view. If you want to think about inequality in welfare, you need something like uh, interpersonal comparison of utility. And that's a very strong assumption. By the way, it's not an assumption that you, you will never make. But in the second, in the second uh, class uh, later on, I will, uh, I will spend some time on a model with transferable utility. And transferable utility, you're assuming exactly interpersonal comparison of, uh, of utility. But it's a strong assumption. Even if you buy this assumption, you still have very subtle ethical problems linked with welfare inequality. There is an old one which can be called the uh, Shylock versus Mother Teresa problem. So uh, Shylock is very wealthy. Mother Teresa has almost nothing. But it might be the case that she's, uh, she's happier than he is. Does it imply that we should take money away from Mother Teresa to give it to Shylock? <laughs> Actually, it might even be the case that by doing this, by taking $1 away from Mother Teresa and giving it to Shylock, you increase total utility. Remember, if, if, if I have interpersonal comparability of utility, I might be able to define total utility. It might be that the marginal value of, uh, of a dollar to Shylock, who was, was extremely rich but also very greedy, is higher than the marginal utility of the same dollar for Mother Teresa, because she has almost nothing, but she doesn't care. And of course, it's very hard to conclude that you should distribute from Mother Teresa to, uh, to Shylock. So for all those reasons, uh, the this idea of, of talking in terms of inequality, of welfare inequality, uh, sounded, to say the least, difficult to implement. Uh, and of course, there is the empirical problem, which is what can we identify? And it's very hard to, to identify uh, the kind of utility that you will need. So people have moved to uh, just considering inequality in income. Now, what I'm going to tell you is that when you look at what's going on within the family, those, comings, those problems are coming back. They're coming back big time. I will try to show you that there are some paradox that do not appear if you think in terms of inequality of welfare, but that can be quite disturbing if you think in terms of, uh, of inequality of income. And we'll come back to that. At any case, the, the main message at this point, and now we're going to start the, the serious stuff, but the, the end of this introduction would be something like those issues, intra-household allocation, public good, uh, economies of scale and so on and so forth, there is no way you can address them without being serious about the way you model households. So in other words, you cannot talk about those issues if you don't have something like a well-defined, well-characterized model of intra-household allocation, which is exactly what I'm going to do now. And the, the one I'm going to use is the so-called collective model that I'm going to introduce next. So this is a general roadmap of what I'm going to do. I'm going to cover some basic concepts. Then I'm going to talk about identification. And I'm going to give you some empirical results at the end of, uh, and that, that will be the first, uh, the first class, so the first two hours. 
And the second class will be devoted to something like an equilibrium perspective. So just to, to get, get you to give you the general the general uh, insights, the general structure. Uh, the first three topics I will consider families as given, and I will I will ask myself the following question: What kind of empirical tools do I have to recover? the intra-household distribution of, uh, of uh, income, taking into account the, the public good, the externalities. And so how can I measure and understand what's going on? And the last part, which will be uh, to which the, the second class will be devoted is, can I come up with a theory that would explain inequality as an endogenous phenomenon? So can I come with a model or a family of models in which the inequality will be the outcome of, or the equi will be driven by the equilibrium conditions of my general models. This is the general structure. You have questions at that point. No questions? Okay. Let me start with the basic concepts. So this is the so-called collective approach. Uh, there is, so it's based on a, a small number of ideas. No, none of them is too controversial. Uh, the first one is that if you have different people, they might have different preferences, which seems obvious. But remember that 80% of empirical work on household just assume that there is one utility function uh, for the entire household. And believe me, it's very hard to talk about inequality with this kind of framework. You need a general assumption about the decision process. So the collective model posits Pareto efficiency. Uh, which, which you know, can be justified. I'm not saying that uh, any household in the world behaves in, a, in an efficient way, but it's certainly a good starting point and it's a good benchmark. So what, what I'm going to do is try to explore uh, this kind of uh, this kind of model. Uh, the main issue is: can we understand and can we empirically estimate the uh, intra-household allocation? There is a related issue that I'm not going to talk a lot, but which is, if anything, the main motivation of all these kind of collective models, which is the, the, the notion of power within a household. So in other words, uh, the way I think, and the way many people now think about household is uh, it's a complex decision process, and there is something like the respective power of the wife and the husband. And this is something that's not exogenous. It's partly exogenous, but it's something that, that that you can influence. For instance, if you're in, in Mexico and, and you, you introduce some kind of uh, in-kind uh, uh, cash transfer program like Progresa, which, which is our oportunidades, the fact that you're giving the money to the wife instead of the husband has an impact. We know that it has an impact on consumption. This, this has been shown uh, empirically. Uh, the way we tend to think about this is to say the, the reason why this has an impact is because it changes the distribution of power between the wife and the husband. Now, it's completely obvious that this notion of power is crucial if you want to think in terms of inequality. You expect that in a, in a household in which one party, say the, the husband, has a lot of power and it's not very altruistic, you can end up with a very unequal distribution. Now, the cool thing with, uh, with assuming Pareto efficiency is that technically Pareto efficiency is equivalent to the maximization of a weighted sum of utility, the weights being the Pareto weights. And the Pareto weight is a very nice natural measure of power. Instead of saying the husband has a lot of power, I'm going to say they're maximizing a weighting sum of utility, but the weight of the husband's utility is much higher than the wife's utility, something like this. Now, I'm not going to talk about power per se. Uh, but, but obviously, it's linked, it's behind, and maybe we can come back to that from time to time. OK, now let, let's, let's try to be a bit more specific. We need to be specific at some point. So I'm considering a group of S agents. Most of the time, I will consider couple just for, for simplicity. So S will be equal to 2. But in principle, the model is completely general. There are two types of consumption. Some are public. Of course, public means within the household. It's housing, for instance. It's a private good if you compare the household with, with other households, but within the household, both, both people consume it. And then you have private consumption. So you have a vector capital Q of public consumption and uh, S vector QS of private uh, consumptions. Uh, it's, you, in general, you observe the vector of public consumption. You may not be observed, you may not be able to observe how much each, uh, each person is privately consuming, which is one of the issues that you're facing. 
You have prices, there is an income of the family, which is why. There could be a, a family production. I'm not going to talk about this, but it's very easy to introduce it. There is a notion which is the, the notion of distribution factors. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about this, but uh, let me just give you the general idea. If you want to take seriously the idea that there is a decision process taking place within the household, then you want to pay a lot of attention to all the factors that can influence the decision process. Think of any factor that could uh, increase the power of the husband or increase the power of the wife. This is something that must have an impact on the outcome. And this is something also that could be useful if we can observe that for identification. Uh, simple example. Assume that the total income, you, we observe not only the total income, but also how much of this income is coming from the husband and how much is coming from the wife. It, it might be, you would expect that in a household in which 90% of the, of the income is coming from the, the, the husband, the, his power is much larger, is much larger than 50% than is coming from the wife. So this is the kind of thing that you may want to exploit. I don't want to be too specific, but let, just think of a distribution factor as any kind of variable which is observable, which doesn't affect preferences, does not affect the budget constraints by, by itself, but might have an impact on the decision process. And that's, that's sufficient for the moment. Now, we need to say something about preferences. The most general case, each utility depends on each uh, consumption. So my utility depends on the consumption of public good, and then my private consumption, and also my wife's private consumption, and my kids' private consumption, and so on and so forth. That's the most general model. Uh, the problem is, if you this is too general, and there is no hope you can identify much in this kind of framework. So we're going to use specific, uh, more specific cases. The simplest specific case is egoistic utility. So I just care about the public consumption and my vector of private consumption, I don't care about the others. Uh, more, probably more realistic is the caring model in which I care about the other people, but I care about their utility. So what I'm looking at is some index which depends on my own utility and then the utility of my wife and then the utility of it, my children. Uh, and now the, the, the good news is that from the collective point of view, there are not, not much difference between the first and the second model. Just because, remember, I'm assuming efficiency, and it's pretty clear that any allocation which efficient with caring utility will be efficient for egoistic utility. So if I'm taking an egoistic model and I'm assuming uh, efficiency, caring will be a particular case of this. In terms of inequality, and in particular in terms of welfare inequality, it's going to make a lot of difference. But, but if we have time, we're going to talk a little bit about this. But in terms of identification, it's pretty much the same. And then there is transferable utility. I don't know how familiar you are with the notion of transferable utility, but we're going to come back to that in the, in the, second, in the second talk. Now, what do we observe? We observe the household demand. And the household demand is the vector of, uh, of public good, and then the total consumption of private goods. That's a vector. But in general, I, I don't know who is consuming what. And I observe this as a, as a function of prices, as a function of income, and possibly as a function of the distribution factors. And there is a budget constraint, which is this. Now, as I said before, Pareto efficiency is equivalent to the maximization of a weighted sum of utility, and those mu answers here are the Pareto weights. That's completely standard welfare theory, you know, econ 101. You could introduce household production that won't change anything. Is that clear so far? Now, let me start with a very specific but very important case. Let me first assume that there are no public consumptions here. Let's assume that all commodities are privately consumed. That's a very particular case, but in that case, things are much simpler. So let's explore it to start with. So what happens if all commodities are privately consumed? Essentially, efficiency is equivalent to the existence of a sharing rule. Now, what's a sharing rule? Let me tell you the, the following story. Forget about efficiency. And assume that the decision process is a two-stage process. Stage one, we sit at a table, 
there is a bag of money here on the table, which is the, the joint income, and we decide how much I'm going to spend and how much my wife is going to spend. There is some kind of decision process there. I have no idea what, 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 what this process may look like. It could be bargaining. It could be more complex than this, whatever. But we just decide how to split that money. That's the first stage. And second stage, I take my share. My wife takes my, her share. I go and consume whatever I want. She goes and consumes whatever she wants. My claim is this is exactly equivalent to assuming efficiency. Any the outcome of a decision process like this will be efficient. Conversely, any efficient process can be described as a two-stage decision process of this type. What the proof of this statement, well, you know the proof of this statement. It's one of the most well-known results in economics. It's the, the two welfare theorem. This is a think of the household as a small economy. It's an economy in which you have only private good, no public good, no externalities, no whatsoever. So we know that there is uh, that A, any equilibrium is efficient, and B, any efficient allocation can be decentralized as uh, an equilibrium using transfers. Is there a question? My, my question is, is that assuming that the other person doesn't have to over the consumption of their spouse? Yeah, so that's true in the egoistic model in which I don't care about uh, my, my consumption. It would be also true if my uh, utility was depending on the utility that my spouse is deriving from her consumption, but not of the consumption vector per se. In other words, if you go back to this, it's true in the egoistic, and it's also true in the caring. The caring, the caring situation being a situation in which I care about my, my wife's consumption, but only through the utility she derives. So I don't have a paternalistic view that she should, she should not smoke, for instance. I care about her smoking just because she derives utility from smoking. And there is no externality. The only difference, to be technically precise, the only difference is that if you're using caring, then you may have bounce on the, on the um, on the sharing rule, so the theorem tells you if you using your if you are using egoistic utilities, then any sharing rule will give you something that's efficient. <clears throat> if you you're assuming caring, there there might be bounds, and sharing rules that give too much to one person and too little to another one might be inefficient. Just because you know, if I'm altruistic, uh, um, an allocation in which I get everything and she gets nothing is inefficient. But in that case, essentially, what, what this means is that there will be a transfer, so it, it will not be reached. Now, why is this notion of a sharing rule important? Uh, now, note that, in general, the sharing rule depends on everything. It depends on prices, it depends on income, it depends on the, on the distribution factors, and so on and so forth. The point is, if I'm interested in intra-household inequality, that's exactly what I would need to observe, right? Because, you know, I have only private goods in this setting, and I know how much she's spending, how much he's spending. So that, that's my definition of inequality. A very important relationship, and I, I emphasize this point because that's something that we're going to lose later on. So it's, it's important to remark that we have it at that point, is there is a one-to-one -one relationship between power, sharing role, the amount you receive, and your welfare. In this kind of model, if you increase the parental weight of the husband without changing that of the wife, then the, sharing, the, sh the share of the total income that you will receive will go up, and his income will go up. I'm emphasizing this because when you, have, when you put public goods uh, in the story, things can be quite different. OK? Now, the problem with this is my model is leaving aside two things that I think are crucial, uh, public goods and economies of scale. Uh, and also household production, and so on and so forth. So what I'm going to do next is ask myself, can I extend this model to economies of scale first, and to household production second? And I want to do two things. I want to introduce some, I want to introduce some conceptual tools that will allow me to model either economies of scale or public consumption. And the next step, I'm going to ask myself, are there tools purely conceptual, or can I take them to data? Is there a way I can identify? And I'm going to spend quite quite some time talking about identification of those concepts. Are you still following me? Yeah. Okay. 
first extension, the notion of economies of scale. Uh, so the idea here, which actually could be traced back to, to Gary Becker, is the, the, the notion of household production or a household technology. Uh, now, here is the story. What I consume, what enters my utility function, is this vector Q. What I'm buying on the market is a vector uh, which, I, uh, which, I call, uh, which I call R. And then there is a production technology in which, uh, which gives you a relationship between R and Q. And let's assume that this relationship is linear. So uh, A is a matrix here. You could do that, actually, with, with more, uh, more general functions. But let, let's concentrate on the linear case for so far. So there is a vector of commodities that you're purchasing. And there is a vector of commodities that you're consuming. And there is a sharing. Now, what, what's the intuition behind this, this technology? Let me come back to an idea. I don't know if you're familiar with the notion of Barton scale. That's something that was quite hot in consumption in consumption theory 30 years ago, but has been sort of forgotten. Uh, although although it's, it's widely used in empirical work. The, let me assume just for a minute that this matrix A is diagonal. So if I take a particular commodity I, the amount I'm, I'm buying, Ri, is this coefficient AII multiplied by the total amount that I'm consuming. Let me give you a, a specific example. Assume that I'm talking about uh, my car, right? So I'm measuring the consumption by the number of, of miles that I'm, that I'm, uh, that I'm uh, doing using my car. OK, so Q1i is how much I am using my car, and Q2i is how much my wife is using my, uh, the, the same car. And let's assume we have only one car. Now, assume for a minute, which actually was, was my case when I was a professor at Chicago, that uh, we always used the car together. We used to live downtown, and we used to commute to the campus. So we would take out the car in the morning. We would drive to, uh, to, the, to the campus, park the car there, and in the evening, drive back home. Now, you see that in this situation, the total amount that I'm consuming if I'm, if I'm consuming the car for uh, 30 miles per day, and my wife is consuming the car for 30 miles per day, the total consumption is not 60 miles. It's 30 miles, just because we, we have this jointness of consumption. So that's an extreme case of an economy of scale. You could call that a public good, and there are subtle differences between public good and economies of scale. But it's this idea that the fact that I'm using this car for 30 miles per day and my wife does, does not imply that our total consumption is 60. It could be much less. And in that case, the extreme case, it will be, uh, it will be 30, meaning that the coefficient AII could be 1 half. Now, the crucial idea is I'm not going to make assumption on these coefficients. I'm going to estimate them from the data. And the question is, to what extent am I able to estimate them from the data? Now, this is extreme because I'm assuming a diagonal structure. If among those commodities I put time, I could have a much richer model in which uh, some commodities, uh, intra-household commodities, are produced using inputs that I buy on the market and also using time. And then I could have a, a serious model. So if in particular, if I, mod I want to model chores, which are done within the household, that could be a, a, a good model. Now, how do you use this kind of technology? I'll come back to that. I'm going to talk about identification. But the basic idea is uh, we're going to assume that your preferences, your basic preferences, those US guys here, don't change with your marital status. You have the same US whether you're uh, single or married. But what does change is the household technology. So that the simplest way of capturing these economies of scale, it could be, for instance, that there is some kind of uh, waste in food preparation. And uh, if you prepare food for, for two people, it's less wasteful than if two people prepare the food for themselves independently. That's compute. That's, that's uh, summarized by those coefficients here. And it doesn't change the fact that you, you, you like fish more than meat or the opposite. But it changes the, the way you process the commodities. So that the, the, the state of the art in uh, talking about economies of scale. Now, what's the link with inequality? Well, you're going to introduce something. You might, how many, let me try something. How many of, of you are familiar with the notion of, an in, uh, of uh, 
of um, equivalent scale. Ah, not so many, huh? Now, the notion of equivalent scale is, um, is quite important uh, and completely ignored, which is a kind of strange situation. Uh, let me give you a, a, a very simple problem for which I need something like an equivalent scale. I, I define a poverty level, and let's assume that the, the extreme poverty level is defined as being uh, an income of $2 per day for, for a single person, you know, which is the World Bank definition. I have a couple. How, how may, uh, what should be the income? How should I define the poverty level for a, for a couple? Should it be $4 or should it be less? I have a couple with one child. I have a couple with one child. What, would, what should be the threshold uh, for a couple with one child? Should it be $6, or is it the case that, that children consume less than adults? Uh, now, the notion of equivalent scale is, is, a, is an attempt to answer exactly this kind of question. And uh, I would say that the equivalent scale of, uh, of the second person in the household is 0.9 if, uh, in order, if I want a couple to, uh, to be as happy to have the same utility as a single person with an income of one, this couple needs an income of 1.9. I'll come back to this definition. I think this definition is, is deeply flawed, by the way, and I will give you an alternative definition in a minute, but that's the notion of, equi of uh, equivalent scale. Anyway, in this kind of framework, you have a very natural representation of this notion, which is the notion of indifferent scale, and here is how you do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. I have been using them in one of my papers. Why? Yeah. When I started to read how they constructed them, it seemed kind of endogenous to measure how much how much a person should consume based on the reports of consumption that are made. If, do you have any comments or insights about it? I think you're deeply right. I think the notion of equivalent scale doesn't mean anything. Uh, let me give you, well, I, I'll, I'll go back to that later on, but let, let me give you a quick answer to that. The standard definition of an equivalent scale is something like this. Let u be the utility of a single person. And let's assume that the same u is also the utility of a couple. Now, the, the equivalent scale is the income yes you should give to a couple in such a way that the couple with this income will be just as happy of the same utility as a single person with income one. This relies on this idea that I can directly compare the utility of a single with the utility of a couple, which for me is completely meaningless. I know what the utility of an individual is. I have no clue what the utility of a couple is. Or it's something like a weighted sum with, with, with Pareto weights that might depend on prices. So it's much more complex, so it doesn't mean anything. Now, in addition, there is the fact that those equivalent scales are, comp are not identified. And there is, a, I mean, the, the main reference uh, on this is a paper by um, Richard Blundell and uh, Arthur Lubel, in which they are showing that the, if you define equivalent scale that way, you just cannot identify them. And it's, very, it's a very serious lack of identification. You give me any numbers, I can construct a model which is compatible with consumer theory and for which those will be the right equivalent scales. So uh, that's the only comment I have so far. This kind of model, the model that, that you've on your screen right now, doesn't suffer from the same problems, and in particular, this one is identifiable up to something. I'll, I'll come back to discussing this uh, in details. But, uh, but if you got the impression that the, the usual uh, notion of equivalent scale is fishy, I could not agree more. I have a question regarding the inequality and economies of scale. Uh, it's almost assumed that the equivalent scale is, also, is always smaller than one. I mean, the additional person has a 0.9, not a one uh, coefficient in front of it. But if there's a lot of inequality or unequal sharing rule, it could be bigger than one. Because if you want both uh, husband and wife to have at least a uh, subsistent level of, uh, of consumption, and if you give more income, the husband is going to take just more, maybe it could be that you need to give $3 a day to, I mean, $5 a day to a couple, so that also the wife has, has enough consumption. Does it make sense? 
there, I think what you say makes sense, but it's not exactly the notion of equivalent scale. What you're saying is more the notion that used in welfare economics of compensating variation. So the compensating variation, remember, the compensating variation is defined in, in standard uh, public economics by uh, the amount I must give to a person for this person to be as well off as before the reform. Okay, think, think of, of, of you want to do the cost-benefit analysis of a reform. The first, you take a person, the income of this person was 10 before the reform, but the reform changes everything, changes the prices, changes the technology, and you're asking yourself, how much should I give now to this person just to compensate the person in the sense that she's exactly as well off after the, the, the reform with the new income as before. Now, when you think about those kind of issues, you're facing exactly the kind of problem you're alluding to, that if you're looking at the capital, do you want the average utility, the, the average welfare to be the same? Do you want the welfare of each and every person to be the same? And, and as you very rightly point out, if you want uh, the welfare of, say, the wife to be the same, you, must have, you, you may have to give a lot of income because most of it will go to the husband. So that's a very interesting issue. It's not exactly in and, and which you can deal uh, that you that can address using this kind of model, actually. By the way, in my reading list, I put a couple of chapters of a book that's forthcoming, joint with uh, Martin Browning and uh, Joram Weiss. And, and uh, you can look in, this, in those chapters. There, there is some discussion about those welfare analyses that go exactly along those lines. The notion of equivalent scale is much simpler. It's, it's really the fact that uh, if I if, if, if when, I, when I'm preparing, uh, when I buy 10 units of food in order to prepare those 10, uh, whatever the number of units that I'm, let's assume that when you're preparing food, you lose one unit for some reason. You know, there is a waste of one unit. So if you have two persons buying, uh, who want to consume five, they, got to, they, they need to buy each of them six because there is the five they're going to consume plus the one that's going to be wasted. If they produce together and uh, they just need to buy 11, uh, so that the one is wasted and the remaining 10 they can, they can share. So it's, it's this kind of idea. It's really something like the technology. So it's not as deep as what, uh, what you had in mind. That said, uh, in principle, those A can be estimated using data. We did that. And in some cases, we did find uh, some A's which were slightly larger than, uh, than one. Uh, and the explanation, but you know, what? Can you think of one commodity for which you, you will find an A larger than one and you will not be surprised? Anyone has an idea? Well, surprisingly enough, we found that for tobacco. That's not very surprising because tobacco is something for which you might have a negative externality. Now, of course, this is a model with private commodities, so we're assuming away negative externalities. But it might be the case that if you have negative externalities, the translation will be something that will sound like these economies of scale. And of course, A larger than 1 is a these economies of scale. So it's not, it's, the data can tell you something like this. And it's quite interesting to try to understand what they're telling you. Let me go back to the single stuff. So now, with this kind of model, another question? I want to ask, so you mentioned previously that the people like fish before they marry, and when they're married, they still like fish, so the preference is like kind of married, because the fact that they get married, is that right? Yes, absolutely. And then, um, how do you deal with the fact that I myself like to marry before they like fish? That would be about matching. So for the moment, I'm considering the, the, the household as given. At some point, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about who, who, the fact that whom you're marrying, and actually the, not only that, but the way the income is shared within the household, might be endogenous. So that's a very good question, but bear with me, uh, bear with me a little bit more. Is that, a, is that a different extension, or is that something? So I guess I'm thinking about, say, transfers, um, where women maybe prefer in-kind transfers when they're married, but maybe prefer cash transfers when they're not. Um, oh, wait, wait, wait. That's, that's a different issue. The, 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 the last thing you mentioned, I, I did, you don't need changes in preferences. It's the fact that when you're married, there is a decision process. So. Uh, one story, which has nothing to do with preference changes, could be if I'm by myself, I receive a cash transfer, I do whatever I want with it, 
infant marriage, the cash transfer, then the bargaining, the bargaining game I'm going to play with my husband is such that the, the cash transfer, he, he will, he, he will uh, appropriate most of it, whereas if it's an in-kind transfer, I have it, I, I keep it. Yeah. So if for, for this, that, that's not a change in preferences in the sense that it's not a change in the way, the utility you derive from the consumption of a particular good. But the minute you introduce the decision process, you will look into that. And actually, that's the reason why you want to introduce this kind of decision process. That, that's exactly the kind of very intri intriguing and, and uh, fascinating question that we want to address with this technology. Now, the first part of your question, we know that preferences do change to some extent. Uh, but the question is, there is a trade-off between what can you do conceptually and what you can identify. If you use the collective model, you can put any kind of preference changes that you want. Uh, the problem is identification can be a bit more complex in that case. But let me let me postpone this because I'm going to be much more specific uh, in in about uh, ten slides about this. But what what do you need to uh, why why is it that you you want to assume that preference don't change? For most of what I'm going to say, you don't need to actually. But at some point, I will need it, and, and I will tell you why. No other questions? OK, anyway, so in this new story, there is a sharing rule, and I'm comparing the utility of the person with the new. The, so essentially, what I'm doing is I'm comparing the utility of a given person within a household with the utility of the same person uh, by, by yourself. So within the household, the person will have a percentage, a fraction rho s of total income. And the utility this person will derive will be the solution of this program here. So that will be the indirect utility for this uh, rho s. Whereas as a single, yeah, the, the person will solve the usual problem and will, will get the usual indirect utility. And uh, the, the, uh, the indifference scale is based on the fact that this y bar s is defined by the the income I should give to the single person to be as well off as that person used to be when part of a couple in which he was received, this person was receiving row S. The key thing is the price is not the same. And the key thing you need to remark is that when there are economies of scale, what this is doing is changing the prices within the household. And the price within the, the price of when there are economies of scale in practice, so in, and the intuition is quite simple. If you think of a commodity for which are large economies of scale, when you marry, those, concern, those commodities are cheaper. In the case of, in the, case of the car, the, 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 the car example that I was, it's as if the price of a kilometer per person was twice less when you marry than you are, than you're single. And you know, but that, provided that you can estimate this matrix A and those utilities here, um, then you uh, then you can estimate this. I'll come back to that when I'll be talking about uh, identification. Let me just, for the sake of completeness, briefly talk about the, the public goods. So now, public goods, I have preferences like this, or you can take the, the caring equivalent. And now I can tell you two stories about the decision process. One story, uh, so now I have the decision is not simply we share money and, and we do whatever we want with the money, because now we have to also to decide on the public consumption. Um, but I can still I can still give you a two-stage decision process story, except that it's slightly different. At step one, we do two things. We, there is this pile of money on the table, which is the income. And we do two things. First of all, uh, we decide how much public good we're going to buy. And second, we decide, so whatever is spent for public good is taken away from the table. The money which is left is for private good. And this one we split. I give some to, to my wife. I keep some for me. And then my wife and I go and buy whatever we want, but conditional on the plans that we've made for the public goods. Because of course, with a utility of this type, the marginal utility of each private good depends on the vector of public good. So everything is conditional on the, on the purchase. So that the, the two step. And now I still have a sharing rule. But the, the sharing rule is the way this private money is distributed uh, between the people. But now everything is conditional on the public good. And that's, this raises some conceptual issue that, that we're going to talk about later on. There is an equivalent uh, version. 
And again, I'm not sure how familiar you are with that. That's the old style public economics. You know that uh, the welfare theorem tells you if you take an efficient allocation, you can, when you have only private good, you can decentralize it using prices. Now, if you have public good, can you decentralize an efficient allocation? And the answer is yes, but you need something a bit more complex. You need a personal prices, what, what the theory calls Lindau prices. So the, the, the way of decentralizing a public good is to face, to, uh, to face each person with, with a personal price for that particular public good. And the efficiency, and everybody is buying the same quantity by definition, but the, the efficiency condition is that the personal prices of the public goods must, must add up to the market price of the public good. I don't know how familiar you are, but there is a story uh, and you can write decentralization here, and of course it works. In general, it works in this framework as well. Now, the one thing that's crucial here is that in both cases, you're losing the one-to-one -one relationship between income on the sharing rule and welfare. When you have only private good, it's certainly true that if he gets more, he's better off. In this case, things are more complex. If you compare two situations in which they make different choices regarding public consumption and private consumption, and in, in the second situation, the wife has a larger private consumption, you cannot deduce that she is better off. Because her utility depends on the public good, and it might be that the choices of the public good made in the second situation are actually something that she doesn't like or she liked a lot the, the, the first situation. So it, must, it, might, it could be, for instance, that in the first situation, a lot is spent on, on children which she likes a lot, so she doesn't have much for her own consumption, but she doesn't care, because she puts a lot of weight on the utility of the children. Whereas in the second situation, uh, despite the fact that she has more for a private consumption, not enough is spent on the children, and she's worse. Now, the point is, uh, you see where I'm going. There's this old idea that, that uh, you should look at income inequality and not welfare inequality can be quite misleading here. Because if you look at, look at income, you might conclude that she's better off in the second situation. And of course, that might be completely wrong. On the other hand, there is no way you can go deeper unless you know a lot. In particular, you need to know how much she benefits from the, from the public consumption, how much she cares about the public consumption. Now, the good news is you can say, to a large extent, something about this. So let me talk about identification. I mean, you see the framework, you see what the issues are. Let's now talk about what we know about the identification of those kind of models. And let me start with the simplest possible framework. I have only private commodities, but even better. I have only three commodities, uh, and two of them I can observe individual consumption. So that's a standard model of labor supply. So there is labor supply on the husband, labor supply or leisure on the wife, and then there is one consumption good. I can observe the labor supply of the husband, I can observe the labor supply of the, of the wife, and I can observe the total consumption of the private good, but I cannot observe who's consuming what. So you know, that's, that's uh, identification 101. The only thing I don't, so the question is, I'm observing those labor supplies, and what do I want to identify? I want to identify the utility of the husband, the utility of the wife, and the sharing room, and the way the money is split. Now, I'm assuming everything is private. In particular, I'm assuming that I, I, I only care about my uh, leisure and my wife only care about her leisure, which is a debatable assumption, but let's, let's, let's stick to that for a moment. The question is, to what extent can I identify all those stuff looking just at the labor supply of the husband and the other people of the wife? And the answer is the one you have here. Surprisingly enough, I can identify everything. I can identify the sharing rule, the utility of the husband, the utility of the wife, but only up to an additive constant. I cannot say how much he receives and how much she receives. I can only tell that up to an additive constant. So my story is still the two-stage the two -stage story, the, the two-stage process story, namely, uh, we put money on the table, I get some, she gets some, and then using this money, we buy some leisure, and some consumption good. I cannot, I can identify the way this is split up to a constant. Let me try to explain you why there is no hope to do better than this. Why do I have a constant? 
So now you understand the, the, the problem I have in terms of identification. What's the nature of the problem? What I do observe is, a labor, is two labor supply functions. And those labor supply functions are function of his wage, her wage, non-labor income. Now my process is there is her utility, which is the U1 here, which depends on our leisure and our, cons uh, and our consumption. There is my utility here, which depends on my leisure and my consumption. And then there is the sharing rule. My claim is this function, this sharing rule, which is a function of wages and non labor income, I can only identify up to a constant if I have a solution. If I, if I can construct a utility U1, a utility U2, and a sharing rule that exactly generates the labor supply function that I'm observing, then I can construct an alternative one, which will be my U bar 1, U bar 2, and row bar, that generate exactly the same observable behavior. They will not generate the same individual consumption, but they will generate the same aggregate consumption. And since I'm only observing the aggregate consumption of the private good, uh, I won't be able to distinguish. And what's the story? The story is very simple. Assume that the truth is, this is how what, what, what she gets as a function of her wage, his wage, and non-labor income. I'm introducing an alternative story, which is the bar story. And in my alternative story, I always give her k additional units. But I'm changing her preferences, which, which I'm doing here, in such a way that in the new story, with the k additional units, she is exactly as well off, she has exactly the same utility as in the initial story without the k units. And of course, I'm doing exactly the opposite for the husband. In his case, you receive k less units, but is exactly as well off as before. Now, it's obvious, if you just draw the indifference curve, it's obvious that if those U1, U2 row are compatible with labor supply, those U1, U2 row bar will generate exactly the same labor supply function. So this K is not identified. Let me come back to a question that was asked before. It could be that if the same person happened to be single because there is a divorce, the utility that this person will maximize would be completely different. This is not excluded by this model. The price to pay is there is this k that I cannot identify. Of course, I cannot identify the sharing rule, but I can identify the variations of the sharing rule. The way this row bar varies with change, where when you change w1, w2, or y are exactly identified, because they are the same for all those functions. They only differ by a constant. In addition, there are non-negativity constraints, so you can put bounds on this. And by the way, there is a very nice new paper by the four co-authors here. Uh, we're doing exactly this kind of analysis using reveal preference approach. And it's, it's, it's quite interesting, but I don't have time to talk about this. But the point is, if you want to identify the k, then you need to assume something about the relationship between the preferences when they are married and the preferences when, when you are single. And in the end of, the, of, the, of, this, of this class, I'm going to talk about two papers that are doing this. One is a paper by Lees and Sites in which they're assuming that the utility, part of the utility is the same when you're married and, and, and when, than when you're single. Uh, another paper, which is the paper by Dubar, Lubel, and Pendecker, is assuming that if you take households with various number of children, there is something common about the preferences that does not depend on the number of children. And I will be more specific in a minute. So that's, that's, you know, that's, that's a much more precise answer to this question, do I need to assume the same utility? But let me make a point which sounds a little bit like a paradox. I cannot identify this k, but I don't care about this k. This k is welfare irrelevant. Why that? Well, remember the construction that I was making. I told you, in my bar, I, I, I just constructed my u-bar solution, my u-bar and my row-bar solution, in such a way that the with the new utility and the new sharing rule, the person is exactly as well off as she used to be before. So if I'm interested in welfare, if I'm interested in questions like, if I do this reform, is the husband going to win, and by how much is the wife going to lose, and how much, I don't care about this case. This case is completely relevant. The technical way of doing this is I can define uh, what's called a collective indirect utility. And the collective indirect utility is the utility that the person S would receive as a function of 
or wage, his wage and non-labor income, taking into account the decision process that's taking place within the household. And my claim, if, if you give me the labor supply function, I can identify these entities. Let me come back to a remark that I made at, right at the beginning. I was saying, should we be concerned in inequality in income or inequality in wealth? Now, you see the kind of paradox I'm, I'm arriving at at that point. If I'm interested in inequality in welfare, K is crucial, because K tells you how much he gets and how much. If I don't know K, I don't know how much he gets and how much she gets. So by definition, I, I don't know what the inequality is. But the problem is this K is irrelevant. It's irrelevant for behavior, and it's irrelevant for welfare. So there is something that, from a welfare point of view, is completely irrelevant. But when I'm interested in inequality, it becomes completely crucial. So there is something problematic here. I'll come back to that. Now, what's the general results? Just for a sec, that was a model. That was a model with uh, only two private goods. I mean, three three private goods. Take n commodities. What you need to identify, the general result is you need one exclusion restriction per person. So there must be, for each person, there will be one commodity that this person is not consuming. And if you have this, then the collective indirect utilities are defined. The sharing rule is not defined, and it's, it's, it's worse than up to a constant, it's up to a function. But the, 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 the uh, up to something is irrelevant from the welfare point of view. So we have this conceptual. Uh, problem, which I was alluding to, namely this k constant, or this function in the general case, is a crucial if I want to talk about inequality, and b completely relevant if I want to talk about anything that's economically relevant, namely behavior, welfare, and anything. Now, if you really want to estimate the k, then I need to assume something about the utility when single as compared to the utility when a couple, and I will come back to that later. Do you have questions about this? Now, remember, this is identification in the simplest case, i.e., a case in which all commodities are private. Let's move to the case in which, in which I have public commodities. So I have, now I have private and public good. Uh, well, I have pretty much the same, the same answer. If I have uh, small and private and capital and public commodities, and if I have one exclusion restriction per person, then the collective indirect utilities are identified. Which means, in particular, that if you write exactly the same model as before, so think of a model in which there is his labor supply, her labor supply, and a consumption good, but assume for a moment that the consumption good is public. By claiming in a model like this, you can identify each and every, each person's utility, and actually the variety of weights, from up to nothing, you can exactly identify from the two labor supply functions. But if you want, if they're private commodities and you want to, uh, to identify the conditional sharing rule, it's only, it's always up to something. And in the case of public good also, uh, of, you know, of course you've got this additional conceptual problem, which is I might be able to identify what's going, the, the, what's going on within the household, but if they're public good, I know that part and sometimes a large part of utilities is derived from the consumption of the public good. Uh, so the and uh, this will be the allocation of the private consumption doesn't tell me anything about the utility people derive from the public. OK, you got this is a very quick overview. Uh, and uh, so do you have questions at that point? Those are the basic concepts. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to show you a couple of papers, uh, try to explain what exactly the way they are, they are working, and uh, give you some, uh, some basic results, uh, empirical results, uh, due to this, uh, that you get from this estimation. OK, so let's move. That the, a paper about labor supply, uh, that's a, a paper with, uh, that I wrote with Bernard Fortin and Guy Lacroix. So the structure is exactly the simple labor supply model I was alluding to. So there are two labor supplies. 
there is one uh, consumption commodity, an, ag an aggregate, each, each an aggregate commodity, uh, and I don't observe individual consumption here. And here we assume that there are distribution factors. So in other words, the goal of this paper is to see whether some kind of uh, external factors that might have an impact on the decision process are found to matter in terms of labor supply. The, the distribution factors we're using are, are, are twofold. We're using sex ratios. So the kind of thing we want to capture is the, is the idea that uh, if you're in a situation, if, uh, if the labor market is such that there is a, a very large, a larger, uh, some kind of unbalance between male and female, say assume that the factor that, the, that the, the marriage market is such that you have more men, men than, than, uh, than women on the market, that should be favorable to women. So the question is, can we see that in terms of behavior? How can we see the fact that everything equal, uh, a larger fraction of men with respect to women translated to a better situation for women? By the way, there is a very interesting paper by uh, Josh Sengreis and co-author in which he is uh, he's not using the same, the same uh, uh, framework. It's more a reduced form approach, but he's, he's looking at exactly the same question is look, looking at immigrants to the US. One thing you, uh, we know about immigration is that when you have waves of immigrations, like the Irish and then the Italians and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, the people from Germany, from uh, Poland, then Jews from Central Europe and so on, the, the first wave of migration in general, there are much more men than women. Women can, can come later. So you have a few years in which you have huge imbalance, like three times as many men as women in the in the population. So the kind of thing that uh, Josh uh, Engreis is looking at is, do we see an impact on this on behavior? And they do find something. So that's it's exactly in the line of, uh, of this paper. And let me now also mention something. Uh, uh, some of my of my students, actually one of them is uh, should be sitting in this class, is working on the following uh, on the following topic. Uh, as you know, there are some states in India in which the, the ratio of men to women is huge. It's uh, 150, uh, 1.15, 1.20, some, sometimes it's as high as 1.30. And it's also the case in uh, some regions of, uh, in China. And you know, you would expect that uh, an, an imbalance like this should have an impact on the balance of power within the couple. You would expect that the situation in which there is an excess supply of, of men and, uh, and women are on the short side of the market, that, that should be good for women. Okay. So you would expect something like everything equal, when this is the case, women are better off. The question is, how do you measure this? Well, take this kind of, so think of the Z as a measure. We were using two of those Z, one was, well, one was a measure of the sex ratio per state, uh, age group, and race. And the other one was laws on divorce. And so it's, in some cases, the laws of divorce are very favorable to women. In other states, it's not the case. Does it make a difference? Now, before looking at this equation, let's try to think a little bit about the following question. Let's take this idea that uh, when the sex ratio is, is good for women, meaning that you have a, a large number of, of men for each woman, Let's assume that this indeed increases the power or the situation of the welfare of women within couples. What should we see in our uh, labor supply model? Now, the logic of a model like this is very simple. Remember, each commodity is in private, and it's something like a sharing rule. So the story is there is a pile of money here on the table. She gets something, he gets something, and then with this money, she buys leisure and consumption, he buys leisure and consumption. If women are in a better situation because of the sex ratio or because of the laws of divorce or anything, essentially, she will get a larger fraction of the same pile of money on the table. If that's the case, and if we assume, as we know it's, it's true, that leisure is a normal good, then she should consume more leisure and more consumption. So what should we see? We should see that actually her labor supply, everything equal, should decrease. Here we're going to look at the intensive margin. So essentially what we're going to look at is we're going to select couples working full time, and we're going to check whether 
those kind of variation have an impact of the number of hours worked by the wife and worked by the husband. Now, of course, by the same token, if she's working less, she should be working more. And in addition, there will be over-identifying restrictions because there will be a relationship between the, in, the impact on her labor supply and the impact on his labor supply. Now, let's move to this equation. If you look at the equations here, those are, those are the equations that we took to the data. H1 is the number of hours, and we're using the number of hours per year using Canadian data. And we use a, a very simple form, but with a cross effect. So I want the labor supply of the husband to depend on the way of, uh, uh, sorry, the labor supply of the wife to depend on our wage, on the wage of the husband, on non-labor income, which is here, and then on the cross terms between his wage and her wage, the idea being that impact, the impact of her wage might not be the same if he is the, the, the main contributor or if he has a, a relatively a smaller wage. We have exactly the same form for H2. Now, if you want this to be derived from a model, a uh, collective model of the form that I was alluding to, you have conditions on the coefficients, and these are the conditions on the coefficients. If you look at the ratio of this cross term in the male and female equation, it should be equal to the ratio of the coefficients of the, of the distribution factor in the two equations, and also we interact the distribution factor with uh, demographics. And the cool thing is that in that case, as I said, you can identify the sharing rule up to a constant. So that's a model in which we don't assume anything about the utility when you're married as compared to the utility when single. We don't take any stand on what the utility of those persons would be if they were single. Actually, we do an, estimate, an estimation for single, but we do that independently, allowing the coefficient to be completely different. But if we assume that this is coming from a collective model, we can exactly identify the sharing rule. And this is the, the, the formula of the sharing rule. Delta is, uh, is, uh, is um, a polynomial in the, in the coefficients, uh, which we, for which we have a closed form. I didn't try it here on, the, on this, plus the case. So that's exactly the situation in which it's identified up to an additive constant. That's the model. Let me show you briefly the results. So this is what we get on the sharing rule. The coefficient don't tell much per se, but that's interesting. So that's, that's how the sharing rule. So the sharing rule is the amount she receives. So the pile of money is non-labor income. Uh, and uh, the, the sharing rule is how much she receives. Of course, uh, what he gets is the total minus what she gets. So let me just. Let's have a look to this coefficient, and let me give you the kind of interpretation of those coefficients. Let's start with this one. This is the coefficient of, of non-labor income. Now, this is telling you the following. If you increase non-labor income uh, by $1, on average, she gets 70 cents out of it, and he gets 30 cents. And by the way, this is pretty much in line with, with estimates that we had uh, using different kind of technique. And it's, 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 it's compatible with the paper by uh, Liz uh, and Seif that I'm going to show you later, which, which relies on a completely different technique. More interesting, look at this number here. This is what happens if we increase our wage by $1 per hour. Now, on average, women in this sample were working uh, 1,600 hours per year. So we're increasing the labor income of the, way of the woman by uh, 1,600. And part of it, she's going to repay to the husband, which is exactly what you would expect. You know, the, the, the household is, is wealthier. She keeps lots of it. And, uh, but, but part of it goes back to the husband. Uh, our estimate is 600, although you can, you can remark that it's, it's not very precisely estimated. And by the same token, this is the number for the husband. You have to be cautious because that's the number, but you should take into account the coefficients, which is here, which is that uh, the, the, the wealthier he is, the less he is repaying to the wife, which is compatible with the bargaining star in which if he's wealthy, he has a, a larger bargaining, a better bargaining situation, he's less likely to, um, to give up to the wife. Those two numbers here. Those are very precisely estimated. And look at the sex ratio. If you change the sex ratio by 1%, on average, the impact is the same as uh, our estimate is it's equivalent to transferring something like 
$2,000 to the, to the wife. Now, the, the total income of those, of those households on average is something around $30,000 or $40,000. Those are couples in which both are working full time, right? So it's, it's something between uh, 5 and 10% of, uh, 5 and 7% of income. A 1% change in the sex ratio is huge, by the way. The, those are US data, so the sex ratio varies between uh, 0.48 and 0.52. <coughs> what's, uh, what's encouraging, though, is that it's very precisely estimating, and it goes exactly in the direction that you would expect, which is completely compatible with uh, Josh Engwright's results. You do observe that when she's in, the, in a better situation, everything we call she works less. The good thing with this kind of technology is not only we have this qualitative property, but we can explicitly translate this qualitative property into a quantification of the redistribution within the household. In other words, we can say things about how the inequality within the household is changing is in response to those variations. But what we cannot say is what the inequality was to start with, because for this you need a constant that you cannot identify. And let me mention finally something interesting. So these are the elasticities. So we, we Is there a question? Go ahead. Uh, like, uh, could you clarify a little bit how sex ratio is defined by community, census tract, or? The, the sex ratio was defined, so we were using the census and it's for for that year the first the the fraction of men the number of men divided by the number of women by state and race so the variation that we're using and here of course so the variation we're using here are uh, by state so essentially what we're assuming is that a marriage market is is the state which is a debatable assumption uh, in particular because I would expect that this would depend on the level of education. You know, we know that unskilled people tend, tend, to, tend, to, uh, tend to marry in, in, in the same state. Uh, it's much less clear for educated people. I'm sure that you guys, when once you got uh, uh, a degree from your institution, are likely to marry from someone from your own state. Or maybe you could use a geographic unit that is, that is smaller. Like uh, yeah, we could, but then I, it's hard to believe that you marry within the same county. You know, the, the point is, if you're, it's, it's, it's not completely clear that what matters is what you have in, at, the, at the county level, at the state level, maybe at the region level. It's, uh, uh, if I remember well, we, we tried a couple of, of, uh, of alternative solutions and it doesn't change much. But you're right, those are the kind of, uh, you know, very technical question that you have to be serious about when you, when you do this kind of estimate. By the way, I don't want to emphasize too much this paper by itself. There are plenty of flows with this paper. You know, it's part of the, of, of the ongoing research and it's, it's old, it's 10 years old. Uh, we, people have done much better since. It's just an illustration of the technology. Could you explain why you expect to find a main effect on the divorce law? Because given the assumption that the doesn't change when you're single and when you're married, I would expect to find like an interaction effect between the ratio, sex ratio and the divorce law, but I, I don't see what's the intuition behind the divorce law part. OK, that's a very good question. And again, I will sort of postpone the answer to my second class because this is completely reduced form. I mean, we have, we have a, a, a structural form for the demand, but it's reduced form in the following sense. The kind of intuition we had in mind was, let's compare two couples who are exactly identical except for one thing. Couple A lives in, the, lives in a state in which the divorce law are extremely favorable to women, whereas couple B lives in a state in which it's very good for men. You would expect that women should be in a better bargaining position in the first state than in the second. If that's the case, we should expect the sharing will to give more to the woman in that case, and you would expect her labor supply to be less. That's just what we wanted to test. Now, what we did not do is an explicit model of what's the impact, you know, an explicit model of the decision process, 
with question, answering questions like what's the impact of divorce law on the decision process itself, but even more importantly, what's the impact of divorce laws on matching, on who marries whom, and of the kind of marital agreement that's made at the beginning. Just because at that time, the, the, we didn't have the, the, the tools to address those kind of questions. My second class will be devoted to exactly this kind of question. That's what I call the, the equilibrium approach. So I think your question is a, is a great one, and, and we will come back to that quite seriously if we have time in the second part. Yes. Yes. That's that's that, again. That's a very good question. Uh, this is I, I, and actually, I, I feel sort of frustration in in your question, and I'm very happy to feel this frustration because now I'm feeling exactly the same frustration vis-à-vis -vis those models. Again, when those mo the, the, those models are answering the following question, looking at the data. Can I recover the, imp the impact on the, that of the sex ratio on intrahospital transfer? Do I have a, a technique that will allow me to identify? But those models tell you nothing about the theory that's behind. It's just how can I look? Well, it's, it's to think of it as a microscope. It's what kind of technique can I use to look? Can I, can I recover? Can I identify? The way we were thinking about those issues when we wrote this article is you can use exactly the same technique in a different country and maybe you will find completely different results. Maybe you will find no impact whatsoever or whatever. But uh, the way, thank you, the way I think about those issues now is we need a structural model of the marriage market. In other words, instead of just saying it should be good for women, can we write a model of marriage market in which we can understand in some deep sense how it works. And that will be my, my second class is exactly about this. Yes? In the um, table we just showed here, so if you want to take seriously, you mean that the divorce laws affect the sharing law, right? Yeah. So I yeah. Can, you, uh, can you consider the divorce laws as being in, in this situation, we, we're taking it as, as being exogenous in the, in the worst possible sense. Uh, in, the, um, in the sense that uh, Part of our identification is coming from differences in labor supply across states. So we're assuming that if we have different people in different states who have different, happen to have different divorce laws, uh, the reason, I mean, you, you see it, it's, uh, the exogeneity is a problem. The only thing I can say about this is that this model is, as, as you've seen, this model is over-identified and we have restrictions. So if the, and the restrictions here are sort of are, are sort of simple. It tells you that the impact of there should be a very close relationship between the impact of the sex ratio on his labor supply and her labor supply, the impact of the divorce law on the two labor supply, and the impact of the cross terms of the of the two labor supply. So essentially, all those coefficients should be proportional. So I have, you know, I have three coefficients in each equation. They should be proportional, and the interaction with, with everything is proportional. Now, if the story was the reason why we have something is, uh, is endogeneity, uh, then I would not expect those, those restrictions to, uh, to uh, hold true. The, surprise, the surprising thing is that those restrictions are completely satisfied. And you, you, it's not because the coefficients are not well identified. Actually, as you can see, they are very precisely identified. I have a student of three here. Uh, but the restrictions are, are, uh, are absolutely not rejected. So uh, which, by the way, is something on which we insist a lot. We insisted a lot when we started working on these kind of models. It's not sufficient to have a model that, that allows you to identify. You must be able to generate testable restrictions so that you can rule out uh, um, alternative explanation like everything is due to endogeneity. Because on, on that said, I certainly believe that divorce laws are, are to a large extent endogenous. Maybe not that to that extent, but, but it's hard to rule out. Has that been looked at boundaries, for example? So if you have a 
So it's the, it's the tax ratio between continuously when you move from one state to the other, but like in the middle of the board and then you could look at the council and what's going on. No, that's, that's a very natural idea, and I think that's a very good idea. To the best of my knowledge, no, no one has done that. But, you know, it could be done. The technology is here. You're, it's exactly the same kind of regression using, uh, using uh, a selected sample. By the way, uh, of course, you need a large sample of couples uh, on the boundary for which you have a reliable, uh, uh, reliable observation of labor supply. That, that might not be that easy to, uh, to get, right? I mean, in, uh, the problem I would expect would be sample size. But in principle, that, I, that, that would be exactly the right thing to do, actually. Other questions? Now, let me show you something else. Those are the elasticity. So here I'm describing the utility. Remember, the model consists of a sharing rule and then two utilities. Uh, and in the utility, what, what, what you're looking at here is the, the elasticity. Uh, and in particular, the, uh, the elasticity of uh, his and her uh, labor supply to, uh, to the wage. So those are the ones you get in the unrestricted model. Those are the ones you get when you estimate the model imposing the over-identifying restriction that I was talking about. And as you can see, they're pretty much the same, which simply is telling you that the model is not rejected. The, the restrictions are not rejected by, uh, by the data. You can do something slightly different with scaring, and it, it doesn't change much either. But what's very interesting are the, the following numbers. If you look at the number which is here, it's, uh, it's large and, uh, and significant, which essentially tells you that labor, uh, female labor supply is elastic to wage, which is something that we knew. And this number here is much smaller, which is the opposite side, but it's much smaller and not significant which tells us that the male labor supply is very unelastic to, uh, to, uh, to his own wage, which is also something that we knew. Uh, but it's, it's sort of, of strange that we should get this. Yeah, why, why is it that, uh, that female, uh, is there something of deep difference in the utility function that would explain that, men, uh, that women react much more than men to changes in wages? Especially given that we have selection here and we're just looking at couples in which both of them are working full time. Uh, right? So, yeah, why do we have this kind of difference? And the model gives you an explanation because this is exactly the same but conditional on phi c. This is, these are the model that you get when you just run a regression in which you explain his labor supply as a function of his wage, her wage, and non labor income. And you do the same for her labor supply. <coughs> What the collective model is telling you is that things that are going on within the household are sort of complex. Because there is something like, uh, if his wage is higher, on the one hand, uh, it, it pays more for him to work. On the other hand, he will have to transfer more to the wife. Because the, the, the amount he transfer, which, which we find here, the amount he transfer uh, is, uh, depends on, the, on his wage. So, uh, and what we observe on real behavior is, the, is a trade-off between those, is the addition of those two effects. Now, this is the, the pure first effect. So that's the effect of a change in wage, keeping, five, keeping the sharing rule fixed. And what you see is that it's much larger. So it's not that it does not change that by himself his utility, his utility is such that he, there is no trade-off between labor supply and consumption. But it's that the decision process is such that given that part of it is repaid to the wife, in the end, we don't see much. So the point is the notion of elasticity, the way we estimate the elasticity in a couple. And by the way, a very interesting question is how do we compare this to uh, the same numbers that we get for singles? And that I don't have time to talk about this, but uh, there is something in the paper about that. And uh, so you're welcome to, uh, to check that if you want. The paper is in the biography. Let me rush a little bit because I definitely want to talk about the other two. Uh, that's a paper that I like a lot. It's a paper by Jeremy Lees and Shannon Seitz. And it, 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 was, it has been out for some time, but it was only recently published in 2011 uh, in the Aristad. Uh, now, what they're doing is, they, this is a paper explicitly about inequality. So they want to estimate the case. Again, if you want to estimate everything, including the constant, then you need to make an assumption 
about the utility of people when they are married as compared to the utility of people when they are single. Here is the utility that they are, the, the, here is the assumption that you're making. So there are public good, private consumption, and labor supply. And what they're assuming is that's the utility that you have when you're married. And you see they're assuming a separability between the public good and the private consumption and leisure. That's the first assumption. And the second assumption is this part here, the sub-utility of private consumption and leisure, this does not change whether you're married or single. What does change is the way this whole package interacts with the public. Which means that in the end you have completely different behavior. But you, you, you're adding the, the structure. Now, it, it so happens that it's exactly the structure that you need. They write the model, they, uh, they take a role to be linear in non-labor income, and this gives them the additional, the additional um, uh, firepower uh, that allows to exactly identify. Now, they don't use the same technique as before. <clears throat> In the previous one, we were using linear regression, actually um, joint estimation of, of several equations. What they do is discrete choice. So the kind of what they model is uh, people have a choice between uh, not working, working part-time, working full-time. Uh, there is the utility of the husband, there is the utility of the wife, and, and they model those discrete choice. They take utility to be quadratic, uh, and they have a stochastic, uh, a stochastic structure behind that. And uh, so it's uh, using this kind of assumption, you can show that the model, you simultaneously estimate the behavior of couples and the behavior of single, and then the model is exactly identified. You may criticize the assumption. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you could, you could find a reason why this, the, the trade-off between private consumption and leisure may not be the same when you're married. But you know, you need to assume something, and, and let's, let's see how much mileage you get from this. Well, the cool thing is, since the model is completely identified, you can compute intra-household inequality as well as inequality across household, and you can compare them. I will just give you those two graphs. Uh, they are using two measures of inequality, the Gini coefficient and the mean logarithmic deviation. Uh, they look at the evolution between 1970 and 2000. Uh, and they have two graphs. The, the, the bottom graph, which is the, the dotted line here, is the, the measure of inequality between households. So that's what you would get if you just take household and you just, and you're just looking at couples, by the way. They are, they are, not, they are not making the distinction between single and couples. This is just, uh, just couples. Uh, so this is inequality between households. This is, is total inequality. So that's inequality between people taking into account not only that people live in a household with different income, but also the fact that even within a household, people have different share of resources, of intra-household resources. And there are two lessons that you get from there. The first lesson is that total inequality is much more than, uh, than what you think. So essentially, this is what the standard measure gives you, and this is what the, what the truth is. Now remember in my example, my introductory example, <coughs> there was this, uh, this decided that most of the inequality could be within the household. What they're telling us is it's not the case, but still a significant fraction of inequality takes place within the household, which means that if you're just looking at inequality across household and disregard inequality within household, you're essentially omitting a very large fraction of total inequality. That's the first message. But the second message, which is even more interesting, is that if you look at the evolution of inequality, it's much the, the increase of inequality is much smaller if you look at total inequality than if you look at between household inequality. So their conclusion is A, the estimation of inequality are largely underestimated. But B, the estimation of the evolution of, of inequality has been largely overestimated. If you look at the, the evolution, those are UK data, of the evolution of the UK between 1970 and 2000, what you find is that the, uh, the increase in inequality is much less than you would think, because the large increase in inequality between households has been partly compensated by a reduction of, of inequality within the household. Now, that's not surprising, and it's coming from one thing, which is 
that the participation rate of women has been increasing a lot over the period. That's something that we know. Actually, the participation rate of men in the UK has been stable, if, if not declining over the period, but the participation rate of women has been increasing. But this kind of model tells you this must be good for women. This must have increased the, 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 the share of income going to, wife, to women and decreased the share of income going to men, which means that this must have driven uh, this uh, must have generated a reduction of intra-household inequality. That's exactly what they find. So their conclusion, which is which is something uh, spectacular, is we completely underestimate inequality at the same time we completely overestimate the evolution of inequality. I see there are several questions. I, I kind of just, uh, did you say how you treat these children? So um, are these one or two uh, households without children all the time? Or do you also consider households Let me be completely, completely honest, I don't remember. Uh, that, that's, yeah. But the paper, the paper is mentioned. Yeah. I was yeah. yeah. Because, I mean, maybe um, the households were getting less children over the time, and also in the regression estimates, which you took that I mean, maybe um, it's not necessarily a preference over a leisure, but also a necessity to stay at home and have kids. I was just wondering how it's going. Yeah. I mean, uh, if I don't, again, I don't remember. If, if there are children, they must control for children. Definitely. I mean, uh, it would not make absolutely no sense to run a regression of couples with children without controlling for children. So that okay. part of this could be, take, could, could, be, uh, could be taken into account. But, but honestly, I don't remember. Not because, like, when you then try to conclude something about stability preferences, it could be kind of misleading if you saw that the wife is not getting more than So then the story would be part, no, but it's not incompatible in the sense that your story would be something like what we observed over the period is a decrease in fertility, and decrease in fertility means that women were less forced to stay at home, and that must be good yeah, yeah, for, yeah. for them. So it's just kind of, yeah, you can, I, I, I was just thinking about the previous slide, so you saw where you had these regressions, and I was just wondering, because you might, um, this Oh, no, but the previous one, the previous one, you mean this one? This is Canadian data on a very short uh, period, so it, uh, you, you don't have fertility changes here. Yeah, here you got, you got, for, I mean, although, I don't know, I, I, I would be surprised that the changes in fertility between 1970 and 2000 would be that huge. But I don't know, actually. The UK, uh, there, there must have been a decline, that, that's for sure. Is it large enough to explain? Well, again, that, look, that's a perfect opportunity for you guys to read this paper. It's a beautiful paper. It makes assumptions, but you get such a huge mileage from those assumptions that it's uh, it's it's a very nice paper. Do you have any, uh, other questions on this? Okay, let me conclude with the most exciting one, uh, which is the, the estimation of the uh, equivalent scale. Uh, so, like this is just a reminder of the of this idea of uh, production technology. Again, what do why do we need equivalent scales? We, because we want to define poverty, if the poverty, if the, the definition of poverty is two dollars per day uh, for a single, what should it be for a couple? What should it be for a couple with single? Of course, for inequality, that's com for comparing uh, uh, households of various sizes, which is what we started from. Benefits: if you pay uh, an amount to single parents with one child, how much should you pay to single parents with two children? These kind of things. Compensation: assume that. Uh, um, that, that's something actually that, that's from a legal point of view is quite important. Assume the husband is killed by accident and there is so the things go on trial and uh, the wife has to be compensated. Usually compensation takes two parts. One is the economic loss and the other one is uh, loss and suffering, something like this. Now, I have very little to say about uh, pain and suffering, but definitely I have to say something about the, the economic loss and my co-author, Otto Lubel, has been working a lot on this kind of, uh, on this kind of issues. Now, we need to say something about, you know, uh, how much income are you losing? How much are you losing by the fact that your husband uh, is no longer there? You're losing his income, but you're also losing in terms of economies of scale and so on. Now, let me come back to the point that I was making before. The standard definition of an equivalent scale, the, the old definition was this. Uh, and that's a question that I don't understand. I don't understand what's the meaning of the sentence, a single is as well off as a couple. 
I mean, I know what the utility of a single is. I have no idea what the utility of a couple is. Actually, this is, in the old style literature in which you are representing a single with one utility function and a couple with one utility function, which is definitely something you should never ever do. So, um, and by the way, uh, I'm, there, there was a question about this. If you look at the history of, of those stuff, it's quite interesting because this was a very hot topic in the 70s. Essentially, for policy reasons, for all the questions that I was uh, that I was uh, that I was mentioned, what's the you know what's the poverty line for a, for a, for a couple things like this? Uh, so that was a very hot topic, uh, and then people started to work. People were starting with this definition here, and then people started to realize that it didn't make much sense, and actually they also realized that the, the concept was not clean and it was not properly identified, and so on and so forth. So the concept, the, the, the academic discussion on the issue basically disappears. And you don't see, since, since 1980, you don't see much about this in the literature. On the other hand, this is widely used because the policy questions are still there. Questions like, how much should you give to the, to the, to the, to the wife uh, as a function of the number of children? These are questions that people answer every, have to answer each and every day. In practice, you have to define uh, a level of poverty. You have to define the benefits, and so on and so forth. So we were in the kind of very strange, I've seen the question. Let me just finish this. And uh, We were in the very strange situation in which there was a topic that was extremely important from a policy point of view, and which was completely ignored by the theory just because uh, and for good reasons, because the, the, the underlying theory was uh, essentially meaningless. Now, if you replace this question with the following one, this one has a sense. If you take a person as a single and you take the same person as part of a couple, how much income do you need in the first case to compensate with respect to the, to the second case? This, I understand what it means. I have the same person, I have the same utility, and uh, I, I need the, with the same utility, how much in, but, but the new technology, how much income do I need to get the, to the same utility? And that, so my, my guess is this literature will start again on good basis because now we're asking the right question. So there was a question. Yeah, well, can we think of the equivalent scale saying, okay, this is the utility that the couple gets? And doesn't that have the properties of scale and then make the comparison between the individual and the couple based on? I don't know what the utility of a couple is. I know what the utility of a person is. I don't know what the utility of a couple is. Is it the sum? Is it the weighted sum? What, what, what weight are you using? I think there is a deep conceptual problem here. Uh, you know, microeconomics is based on individualism, and individualism has a very simple definition. One, each person is a decision unit. Uh, it doesn't mean that you cannot consider a group. It means that if you're considering a group, you must be explicit about what's going on, about the individual interaction within the group. So this is one, the, the kind of stuff I've been presenting is one way of doing this, one way of being serious about the decision process, modeling it using this Pareto efficiency assumption and the sharing rule and Pareto weights or whatever, and, 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 and then using this kind of technology. I'm not saying it's the only one. You can think of plenty of alternative models. You could think of non-cooperative models, for instance, asymmetric information, whatever. But the point is, the one thing I would strongly object is this notion of there is something that the utility of the couple. And, and honestly, I'm not, I'm not, I mean, I'm not trying to take a, a kind of theatrical position here. I just don't understand deeply what it means, the utility of a couple, which is my, my main reservation with the, with the initial literature on the equivalent scale. A sentence like the couple is just as well off as a single, I don't, I don't know what it means. Whereas a sentence like this person being part of a couple is exactly as well, as well off as she would be as single, this I understand because I'm comparing the utility of a person. It needs the same person in both situations. Am I, am I answering your question? Other questions about this? OK, let me move. I'm, I'm sure you will have questions on what follows. So let me tell you, remember, this is the, the part about identification. So let me tell you what we can identify. So the main result is you can exactly identify. Uh, can I ask a question? Yeah. So, because, so you said like, you don't really understand the concept of the utility of the model. Like, well, like, would this view, like, wouldn't we dismiss like, the social engineering theory? So like, the social function can act 
I fully agree, and actually you're right. You have been a bit too fast. Now let me let me give you a precise answer. Right? And, and I think you you exactly got the got it right. Actually, I can define the utility of a couple in this model. Because remember, what I was saying is, the, I'm assuming Pareto efficiency. Pareto efficiency means that you're maximizing a weighted sum of utility. Mm -hmm. Call that the utility of the couple. The model is completely consistent. You, I can define the utility of a couple. The problem is, I don't want to assume the Pareto weights to be constant. Because that would, be, would not make any sense at all. If there is any kind of bargaining taking place, if you change the wages, you would expect the respective weight to change. So what I can define is the utility of a couple, but this utility in general will be price dependent, income dependent, and depend on everything. Uh, now, I fully agree with the fact that I can do this definition, but then the hope of comparing this utility of a couple with the utility of a single becomes completely, uh, it's, it's, it's now obvious that you cannot do that. You cannot do, do this kind of comparison. So I fully agree with you. And by the way, this is completely in line with, with social choice theories. Here, what, what social choice theory tells you is that you know, what starting with our theorem is there is no naturally simple way of aggregating individual preferences into a collective preferences. There is no way, whenever you consider a group, there is no natural way of defining the utility of a group in the same way as you define the utility of a single. So I realized that what I said was a bit misleading. In practice, we use something that the utility of the couple, but it's not a utility in the usual sense if only because it's price dependent. And in particular, this, the, the, the demand function that comes from the maximization of the utility of the couple will not satisfy Slutsky just because those utility are price dependent. Am I, am I answering your question? Thanks. Now, about identification, and I, I let me rush because I'm, I'm done with my time, but uh, we have exact identification. What does it mean? Uh, it means that I can identify indi individual preferences from single and then the technology from the comparison between single and couples. But I need a lot. What do I need? And this is the paper that I wrote with Martin Brown and, Martin Browning and, and Arthur Lupa. Uh, I need one exclusive good per person, that's okay. I need to be able to observe the demand for single. So essentially I want to, I want to identify the utility of single from their own behavior. Now that's okay if we're talking about adults, but it's problematic if we're talking about children because we're not going to observe the demand function of children. In addition, I need uh, some, some assumption of the utility for one single and married, and then I need in addition price variation. And again, that's problematic because most data sets, we don't have much in terms of price variation. That's the situation, and we have a paper that, that, uh, that has been recently published that's doing this, but there is a much nicer paper uh, and I can say that because I'm not a co-author of this one, by Dumar, Lubel, and Pendekor, they use exactly the same framework, and they make one additional assumption, which is scaling variance. Scaling variance means <coughs> let's assume that the sharing role is proportional to income. That's a strong. So essentially, if in the poor household, as a function of wages, uh, she gets 40%, he gets 60%, and in a rich household, in rich in terms of non-labor income, it will be the same sharing. Of course, it might depend on wages, but, but as far as income, as non-labor income is concerned, we got the same. That's a strong assumption. But by the way, that's an assumption that's made by all the literature on equivalent scale anyway. So it's not that they are they're introducing something that people are not doing before. But what they're showing is that if you make this assumption, then you get a lot of mileage, first of all. Uh, you don't need the utility of single to be the same as the utility when married. You can get the identification just from comparing households, couples with a different number of children. And you need something like the marginal rates of substitution between private consumption by adults does not depend on the number of children. And then you got 
identification from angle curves, so you don't need price variation to do this identification, which makes it much more robust, even for children, despite the fact that you don't observe the demand for children. So you make one assumption, which is debatable, but you get a lot of mileage. And let me conclude on this. So this is, uh, this is some estimation they made in uh, Malawi. So that's the shearing goal. And so they are a, a, a large fraction of the paper is identifying the economies and diseconomies of scale, which is quite interesting, actually. But I, I don't have time to talk about this. But this is just the shearing goal uh, within the household. So this is how much, on average, she gets. And uh, the, there is, of course, the, the weight share depends on a bunch of characteristics. So there is a, a, a distribution here. That's for men. That's for women. That's for, uh, for uh, each child. Uh, that's for one child family, two children family, three children, all, 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 uh, and so on and so forth. I just want to mention the last two columns. Uh, those are the definition of poverty rates using the standard uh, World Bank definition, namely uh, two, less than $2 per day and per person. What you got on the right hand side is what you would find in official statistics, essentially, uh, you would say that, okay, let's take a couple with one child, the, the, the equivalent scale of this couple will be 2.6. So we take the income with divided by 2.6, and if this is less than the poverty line, this, this household is, is poor. If it's above this, this household, the, the household is not. What they do is they say, wait, we can do better than this. We can, since we know how much he's receiving, she's receiving, and the child is receiving, we can do exactly the same individual per individual. And what you find is that actually the number of men below the poverty line is much less. Why? Because the household is poor, but he's getting, getting a large fraction of the resources of the household, so he's less likely to be below the poverty line. The fraction of women below the poverty line is pretty much the same slightly below. But the fraction of children below the poverty line is much higher. So here you see big time. The notion of poverty at the household level doesn't mean much. What means something is poor men, poor women, and poor children. And by poor, I mean technically with a level of expenditure which is below the threshold of $2. By the way, here what they're using for children is the to, uh, is a uh, 0.6 time, time an adult, so the poverty line for children will be uh, $1.2 per day and per person. But what you see is that you got a huge fraction of children below the poverty line and a much smaller fraction of men, just because we have this huge inequality. Now again, I remember I started this talk by saying you never ever want to assume that the distribution of income is equal within the household. It doesn't make much sense in the UK or in the US, but in the, but in the, in the developing country, it's just laughable. Here is an estimate and their assumption, which could be criticized. I'm sure that we're going to do much better in the future. But this is telling you that now we have a technology that allows us to understand what's going on within those, those kind of situations and gives us numbers. And the first result you get from, the, from this technology tells us that we're missing a lot, a huge amount of inequality by using the tools that we're using so far. So this, is a, this has been an introduction to those tools. And uh, feel free to, to use those tools for future research. I mean, those tools have to be improved. And the only way to improve those tools is for you guys to use them for your own research. There was a question. There is a question I see. Yeah, go ahead. In this paper, you're assuming that the... Uh, I'm not hearing you. You can flip it on. In this paper, you're assuming that... The I'm sorry, I'm... Oh, here, now I'm hearing you. Go, go ahead. In this paper, you're assuming that the sharing rule is proportional to income? Yes, they are. I'm not, I'm not a co-author. Okay, they, they are. But then, then, then we actually don't know the poverty of the individuals because it depends on the sharing. And if you were assuming the sharing rule, how can we say that the children are a lot poor here? No, 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 wait. I'm assuming that the fraction going to the husband in this is the same in poor household and in wealthy household, but it must depend, might depend on plenty of other things. And they are regressing on a plenty of, of other indicators. They, it can depend on the ethnic, it can depend on the type of household, it can depend on rural versus urban, it, can, it does depend a lot on the number of children and, and everything, right? The point is, 
They're assuming that if the, the, this number, 0.463, is not assumed. What's assumed is that whatever number is applies to wealth, to, to, to income, at the, to a household at the top and the bottom of the income distribution. But this number, 0.63, is just the outcome of a regression. So, you know, different data with exactly the same assumption could have, you, if you use exactly the same assumption with US data, probably you will get much smaller numbers here and much larger numbers there, or I don't know. Think of it as a function of form assumption. I'm just assuming that the, the, the sharing rule is linear in income, and then it might depend in, in flexible way on a bunch of other stuff. Other questions? Yes? How do we think about the relationship between the last two columns, the poverty rate and the equal, and the poverty rate and the equal? Well, so the poverty rate equal is what, what poverty rate do you get if you assume that the sharing of resources within the household is equal? And the other one is we don't make this assumption, we recover the distribution of income within the household using the technology that I showed you. So in the first one, you know, uh, since uh, the since the husband and the wife get, get exactly the same uh, the same uh, amount by assumption, either they both above or they both below. Whereas in the other one, since they don't get the same, uh, they don't get the same, and then we we uh, I mean they 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 identify how much they are getting. Um, they uh, you you end up with a situation in which. Uh, men are much less likely to be poor than women, and both men and women are much less likely to be poor than children. But see, so what I'm saying is there is a huge amount of intra-household inequality here, and the, the, column, the, the right side column, the, the equal, poverty rate equal, is just assuming that the way by assuming that everybody gets the same. Yes. Yes, actually, it's, it's derived from the sharing rule. Once you have identified the sharing rule, you know, once you have identified the sharing rule, you, you know how much he gets, how much she gets, how much the children get, then you just count how many men are above the poverty level, but using what he really gets instead of what you assume he gets, what, what you would impute, assuming that, he get, that everybody gets the same share. Not from this, because they are not assuming that the that they are not assuming that the, that the sharing is the same across families of different size. One thing you could do is do this estimation of a subsample of four households, do the same estimation of a subsample of, of one year household, and see if the coefficients are the same. Right? Because you know that that would be the basis uh, of the. Uh, I don't think they've done that, but I don't know actually. The best thing at that point is, uh, if you're interested in this, first read the paper. So it's a paper that's forthcoming in the AER, or maybe it's published, I don't know. And by the way, this one might be missing from my reading list, so I will, I will, I will have to, uh, to email a copy. Um, and then feel free to send an email to Arthur Lubel or to Krista Pendekor. Uh, they are very nice people, and uh, definitely this. Uh, what I'm just saying is there is a technology here that at least deserves to be explored because it's exactly what we need to answer questions which are A, completely crucial, and B, completely underestimated, actually ignored by the existing literature. <laughs>